Okay, thank you. Just share my screen with you again. So yes, I've, I've tried to mute my own uh, notifications here. Um, okay, well, thank you all uh, for uh, for joining. Uh, I uh, my name is Dominic Lugesh. I work for the Center for Teaching and Learning at the University of Oxford. And so this is a webinar on uh, what is the evidence for the various principles and practices um, that happened in the instructional videos and what do we actually know when we talk about instructional video. So what I wanted to uh, ask you just to better start it, uh, feel free to turn your, your, your webcam on uh, and do use the chat. Uh, feel free to just ask questions, answer questions, like keeping an eye on it. Uh, and if you'd like to uh, interrupt at any point, you can just raise your hand and to speak. Otherwise, we'll just keep everybody muted. Uh, and uh, so first, I want to start by getting to know each other. What is it that you're hoping to get out of this session in this uh, warm weather? Um, so if you can use the, use the chat um, to share, the, share some, some thoughts or if somebody wants to speak up, maybe. to give you a minute and see if I can. Oh, okay, so evidence by suggestion, what the research says, all right. Uh, do you have any sp particular questions you will let you hoping to have uh, to have answered? Um, length of videos, okay, yeah, we will spend some time on, on, on that. That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very common one. Uh, yeah, some just general tips. Okay, wonderful. Okay, well, we'll definitely, uh, we'll do include quizzes. Well, that's a good question. Yes, uh, I, I think I think that that's another, another good question. So I, I'll essentially run through quite a few things. Um, so if you feel like you're, it's just too much stuff happening, I did create um, a link. I just shared that link with you in the chat where the presentation is and where also the, uh, a document that I've created, I'll talk to you about in a bit, uh, is where I've sort of summarized some of this, some of this stuff, and also many of the links that I'm mentioning will be there, uh, will, will, will be there as well. And I'm just going to acknowledge Rosemary saying that evident, you know, what, what is the technical skills um, that are necessary to make a video effective? So we'll, we'll talk about all of those. And uh, feel free to just kind of periodically uh, check in with you, um, uh, but you can just use the chat for that, you know, if, what I'm talking about makes sense. If you're not sure about, if you have some questions, and we'll also use a Padlet, and I'll share the link with you when the time comes uh, to review what people are hoping to uh, to get out of this. I'm just I'm looking more in the chat and what people are also think, um, thinking about. So how, whether to chunk instruction videos, that's that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, additional extended activities, and and then Emma's talking about. Uh, um, you know, so good practice uh, in based on evidence as opposed to sort of the best practice, um, and um, so that's um, that's that's definitely something we'll talk about as well. So uh, that is just to get us started. So let's talk about then what is the uh, what are the the principles and, and practice that be, that we know that goes behind what makes educational videos effective. And ju just uh, a kind of a, a disclaimer at the start, it's not a detailed guide on using tools. Sometimes people uh, are expecting that. It's, it's just an overview of some of the principles and, and the research evidence to be aware of. And, and we'll talk about roughly in these of six, uh, six um, areas. Well, so we'll start with the principles of instructional video. And I'll talk about the evidence and I'll introduce the six task framework, a way of which I would like to, um, to summarize this and then Finally, I'll apply those to the questions about video production and how we can answer them based on that evidence. And so what is the evidence for effective videos? And this is something that's been puzzling me for about two or three years now. We, we introduced this new tool called Rapid MOOC um, at Oxford. And so I started doing research about so that I can give people better guidance in this. And so this is this is kind of the results of the research that I've that I've um, uh, been able to collate. Uh, and there, there's many strands of research. There's research on multimedia that goes back about uh, uh, 40 years now, actually go back into the, back, back into the 80s. Um, and then there's research on MOOCs, which is only about 
you know, 10 years old. And uh, research on the flipped classroom, which precedes MOOCs so by a little bit. And then, but also we can look at other things, such as the view numbers on YouTube or sales of various products. But also we can uh, listen to people's sharing of their personal experiences. Because uh, there's a huge variety of instructional videos across the various MOOCs out there on YouTube and other services that we often uh, overlook. And so I put together this video sampler of instructional videos of different types of, of videos. And you can, uh, that there's, a, there's a link again on, on the link that I shared earlier uh, on that OSF page. So there's a link to that. And essentially, so here is an example of six, uh, of six videos on the same, uh, on the same topic. Uh, it's all about explaining uh, derivatives. And as you can see, these are all quite popular on YouTube, and they take very different approaches. Some of them is a lot, a lot happening. Some of them not quite as much. So on the left hand, left hand top corner, we have the uh, here we have the Khan, Khan Academy, where just somebody's talking and and writing. Uh, then here we have a, kind of a more PowerPoint-based video, as you can see, is a little more traditional. But here on the other hand, then we have somebody just literally just standing in front of a whiteboard and 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 talking. That's just recording of a lecture. Uh, here in the bottom, there's there's the three blue, uh, three blue one brown a video, a very famous YouTube channel for math explainers. Here in the middle is is, is kind of a more traditional, slightly less um, animated um, example, and then, and then we have some sort of a more sort of an informal example here at the bottom. So you can see this whole wide variety is just one topic, and the, these have all found an audience, all found people who are interested in learning from these videos. And if you look at the comments, if you look at the view numbers, you'll see that, that despite their very different approaches, they, um, they all have something to contribute. So, uh, so as we can see, we can go, so this is gonna, these are all from YouTube. And so where else can we go to learn about what instructional videos look like? And uh, we often, underestimate the, the the huge vastness of the ecosystem of videos out there. So there's LinkedIn Learning, which many universities, uh, for example, at Oxford, we have that available to all staff and students. So that has a very successful business model sold for a billion, uh, a, a billion dollars to LinkedIn and then now part of Microsoft. There's a Udemy, which is a place where it's kind of one of the alternatives to LinkedIn learning, uh, you formula know, Linda, uh, where people, many people sort of create their own courses rather than be centrally managed. A very different approach, for example, is creative live service where they record live sessions with uh, sort of stage live sessions with, with audiences in them, which is quite different, but also a very interesting approach. Uh, you've probably all seen on YouTube being advertised masterclass, um, that were, which, is, which is kind of more of an infotainment. But there's a, here's an interesting company called The Great Courses Plus, which started in recording audio lecture audio lectures in the 1990s goes back, way back and it records entire lecture series on various subjects from you know, medieval religion to, uh, to cooking. And, uh, and that's now all in videos as well. And, uh, uh, and but here's another series that people may realize is, is also part of that ecosystem, IT Pro TV. And they actually run a little TV, that live, little live sessions that they record, uh, but they're always running some sort of a live sessions on, on, on uh, IT training. So, uh, so those are all. Uh, so th th those are all sort of um, perhaps not quite as well known in, in the education sphere. Uh, but we all know Khan Academy, which uh, started got its start on YouTube, and of course, there's all the whole MOOC platforms, you know, the edX, Coursera, FutureLearn, uh, are you know, the main ones. But there's also this huge ecosystem of private video courses, people just making courses out there on subjects and selling them individually. So, for example, is uh, F Stoppers is a, is a photography website and, and it's sort of community, and they, they create these really advanced, really um, beautifully shot uh, sort of all TV kind of David Attenborough style TV series of photo, uh, photographing. Um, and you know, they, yes, you can see they're they're not cheap. You can buy one uh, for you know for three hundred dollars in, in this case. So and, and there's many others who are various price ranges for various topics out there. Uh, so so that's all important. But but of course, all of this comes from from YouTube. So so I already mentioned YouTube as being an important source of information. Uh, and, and so we actually always kind of keep an eye on what's happening there as well. And I'll, I'll mention some examples from YouTube later. But the important thing that I have, the message that I, I want us to focus on is that the bulk of the academic research does not consider these. So there's this huge, vast ecosystem of people learning and creating videos for learning, but we don't have, uh, we don't have any, uh, we don't have that good research on that. So there's uh, here, there's three books that you may find that have quite a lot of, uh, you know, quite a lot of sort of the research summaries of some of the 
often cited as, as very as very as a good sources of uh, of research. And so, uh, so how often do they mention YouTube? Well, um, the first one's from 2009, so they can be forgiven for not doing that. And then it's a once and twice. Uh, the, the later books. How do how many times they mention MOOCs? Well, they, not at all. So how about the the, the multimedia learning uh, third edition of of that of that book by Richard Mayer? came out uh, just this year or sort of late last year, but they're they saying 2021 edition. And so how so is it all in there? So how, how many times gets he to mention, gets mentioned three mentions, that's, that's better. It's all, unfortunately it's all footnotes. Uh, and, and there's MOOCs, not a mention, LinkedIn learning, not, not, not the peep great courses or anything like that, nothing. And of course, is anybody mentioning TikTok, of course, right? That's that's not going to happen. So, so you can see there's so much learning and video production going out there for, from all across the sphere. And, and we don't really have lots of good evidence. And on top of that, if you look at some of the research evidence that we have, it's also based on, on quite old uh, designs and approaches to multimedia. So, so for example, this really good book, E-Learning and the Science of Instruction, has that, you know, you look at some of the examples and say, well, that's not the kind of things we're seeing these days. So, so we have to take that with a pinch of salt. We have to understand the limitations of that research. Because I often see this, uh, uh, these principles of multimedia learning that are based on this research tradition mentioned, and you've probably heard about that as well. Uh, the number could be anywhere between eight and 15. So it used to be the last time I heard about was 12 principles, but the latest uh, version of the book has 15 principles. And uh, some examples of some of these principles of multimedia learning is that words is a multimedia principle, that words and pictures are better than words alone. Coherence principle, exclude, ex exclude extraneous words, pictures, or sounds. Signaling principles, highlight essential material. You just use outlines, headings, bolding, pointer words, stuff like that. Spatial contiguity principles, when you have a graphic and its description, they should be near each other or then through some sort of an index. Temporal contiguity, when you're talking about something, show that thing on the screen and don't show other things. Now, segmenting principle, make, you, make sure that users can pace their own watching, so it's better uh, if the users can pace the learning rather than continuous flow. Pre-training principles, make sure that uh, all the names, concepts, definitions are available before people start watching the videos. Personalization principle, it's better to be kind of a personal speak directly to your audience than a formal style. And as redundancy modality principle, graphics and narration uh, are better than, uh, than graphics and text. Uh, or if you have all, all three, so it's good to have a picture and talk about it rather than have lots of, uh, lots of other things. And all of these things rely on what's been called the theory of cognitive load. And essentially, uh, that's the idea of what's in your, we're trying to limit um, focus on the processing in, in, the, in the brain and limit all the distractions, limit extraneous additional load and support, promote positive cognitive processing. But there's a very big limitation, but not just the fact that there's not so many, uh, there's, there, there's not so many videos uh, out, and not, not just that there doesn't cover the range of videos out there people are learning from, but it's also, it's based mostly on research that's on undergraduates who are beginners and it's mostly in STEM subjects because it's, it's a lot easier to check and it's also, there's more a lot of the early videos were done. So that's really important to remember. This is not a universal video. Uh, for, and many of these rules and principles are broken by very successful and popular educational videos that people watch, like to watch, and they say they are learning from them. And here's an example of one, which is Richard E. Mayer, who's the researcher associated with much of this tradition. Uh, and even though he's not the only one, obviously. Uh, and he gave a talk uh, some years ago at Harvard, which is a, an hour and a half long lecture that uh, breaks pretty much every single one of these principles. But nevertheless, I uh, learned a lot from it because I'm not a beginner. I was uh, already quite a lot of this stuff and it was very useful to see, uh, to, to hear uh, Richard Mayer talk about that as opposed to just read it in a book. So it was very valuable. Nevertheless, none of those principles would be uh, apply, um, uh, apply there. So there are also other so, 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 so there's the big, the biggest research, the chunkiest sort of source of research evidence is that's quite limited. There are more places to learn. Uh, there's, there's other traditions. Uh, Jack Kumi represents one going back to the Open University research, going back to 1970s. So he has a, a book on, on, on where, where he kind of reframes that that question as well. So that's that 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 is worth uh, being aware of that there are some other research traditions. There's also the research on MOOCs. Which is not that, uh, which is not really, uh, which is um, wouldn't really constitute this a strand of research just yet. But it's there's some there's some useful things. So uh, I have tried to summarize 
this and other issues that I've come across from from watching these um, these um, uh, watching sort of looking at the research, looking at the, the actual different video practices out there into what I would like to so summarize under the six tasks of educational practice. Before we go to that, I'm just going to check if there are any questions or comments or thoughts. Mm. I, li I like that discussion about about um, uh, whether we, what about the focus and length. Yes, so I think that's all. That's all very important. I'll, I'll follow up that link on that. Okay, so let, let's talk about what I'm calling the six tasks of instructional framework, and then and that is outlined in a document that you, you can you can see on that link that I shared earlier. I've also published a, a very sort of short summary of that in the Media and Learning News website. That, again, the link will be on uh, in the presentation that I'll share. And I'm summarizing this into roughly sort of six words: attention, distraction conceptualization, connection, navigation, and situations. So nice shin, shin words uh, to, um, to go together. And so, so essentially the idea about attention is that you want to direct the attention to make it clear what to focus on, uh, which is kind of similar to what we heard from here. Distraction, well, you want to minimize the distraction to reduce cognitive load. So in some ways, these two kind of summarize a lot of that, those principles that from Mayer. Uh, the conceptualization, support conceptualization to maximize learning. So support the ideas as well as the uh, as as well as the sort of overall processing. Next one is connection. Make a personal connection to promote engagement. That's really where video shines. That's why where video can can give you more than just a book. Navigation is enable navigation through the video to give learners control over that over over their learning experience. I find a situation which is balance the choices based on the learning situations. So for example, here are some examples of, of things you can do in these areas. So to direct attention, keep the amount of content on screen low. So don't put too many things. Use pointers or animations uh, to highlight what you're talking about. Um, use multiple slides when you have a long list. Uh, so the one, bullet per, um, uh, one bullet per slide. Use simple backgrounds, use proportional transitions, minimal animations, don't add decorative graphics. So different ways of minimizing distractions. How you can also, uh, you can also, uh, you can, you can also um, do other, you can also do other things in terms of, uh, in, in terms of supporting conceptualization. So one of the things you can do here is that you can, it's not just, and I think that the, the really important principle about conceptualization, it's not just about the watching uh, of the video. It's also about the what happens before. So, the pre, so think about pre-watching activities. Is there a little quiz or just a list of words or some way of priming people uh, before they watch the video? So they don't go into the watching entirely cold, particularly if that's this main source of, of learning. Explain new concepts um, outside of that video. Explain in a separate video. Make sure there's only a certain amount of new concepts. Make sure there's a clear structure to that video. Uh, and post um, uh, post have something that happens after the video, so post video quizzes. So that's those are all all the things that uh, that are part of that. And so, uh, how do you make a connection? Well, first you want to address your audience, so speak to the people directly. Use a natural voice, speak in a, in a natural voice rather you know don't use synthetic voices, don't use actors, uh, just speak you as the expert. And then have a face in the video as well. So that's another another example. To enable navigation, provide a table of contents if there's a video, uh, create, put videos together in a playlist if there's multiple shorter videos, uh, make sure the learners can actually adjust the speed of playback, and don't put little sort of advertising pre-rolls in, in front of your videos. Just start, go straight into the, uh, in, in, into the meat of the matter. And finally, what are some of the balance, some of the things to balance in the situation? What, what are the things to balance there? So as beginners, Consider whether the, the viewers are beginners or slightly more intermediates or, or experts, and that will that will have a great impact on what you want to do with your videos. Uh, is the video a conceptual or a procedural video? So, are you talking about more general concepts? Are you explaining how to do a particular sort of a math formula, or how to assemble something? And uh, is you know, how much time is available for the students overall? Not so it's the videos. Uh, you know, have a defined time, so it's important to kind of to keep that in mind. Uh, is the platform that you're presenting the videos on flexible enough? Does it allow all the all the downloads and things like that? And finally, you know, is that something that people? What are the situations? What are the places that the people will watch the video? And so those are all things to to keep in mind there as well. So so I like so so I use these sort of six tasks as uh, because I find them easier to remember. 
and sort of more descriptive uh, and not quite as specific as those 15 principles of multimedia learning. They cover more of the choices and they also sort of take into account some of the real video needs as opposed to just very narrow, uh, narrow situations that the, the research. And I also find it easier to evaluate whether these videos do what, what, what you're doing, what you're talking about. But it's still very, some of the disadvantages, are, it doesn't really uh, obviate the need for thinking about those principles. I'll often be mentioning those. And also there's, there's quite a bit of overlap between those six tasks because uh, you, know, you can never quite, uh, quite easily delineate things in that way. So um, next, uh, I want to talk about how you can answer 12 questions about producing instructional videos based on these principles. So I'm just going to quickly check in with people via the chat. So we will I've seen some of the questions in the chat right now. We will, I will be addressing those as specific, these 12 questions. That was just kind of a pre, um, so what are uh, about the face and, and so on, uh, we'll, we'll, um, um, we will share that. And I've noticed some people are missing those links. I will share that link again. I'm sharing that link right now. Again, just those who joined late, they may not see the early stuff on that. So, so that's where the presentation is. Many of the links I'm talking about as well uh, as a, a document and where I've outlined these things in more detail. So here are the 12 questions. So I'm not gonna, uh, so, so essentially we're gonna be talking about length, uh, scripts, uh, things like face, and, and so on. So, so, so let, let's go into that. And as I said, I have outlined this into in a document that's uh, about 25 pages long, where I've tried to sort of address each of these, um, each of each of these questions. There's a list of references and some appendices there as well. And you'll find a link to that on the by the link um, that I that I shared with you right now. Okay, so I've I've, I've uh, organized these questions into areas, in four areas: timings delivery and format and presentation. So uh, let's start with questions about timing. So I want to address a question about length, introduct intro, intro or pre-roll, the speed of transitions, graphics, animations, angles and perspectives, and the narrative structure. So the question is how long should a video be? So let's use the chat. Uh, how long should an educational video be? So what do you, what do people reckon? What's, what, what, what is like a good ideal length for an instructional video? Less than five minutes, eight minutes, six minutes, three to five, 10 minutes or less, 15 minutes or less, five, eight. Okay, so we're getting kind of a nice, uh, nice, nice spread here. And so I think what is really the important uh, of the task, what is it, what is the video, what is the task of video as, uh, 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 trying to achieve. And I think the, t the length of the video is really all about the control of the navigation of uh, that you can, you can enable the user. So if you Google that question, you will find something like this. You know, there's no, like there are articles on, on the web that say no video on, online should be longer than two minutes. And, and of course, that's just complete nonsense. That just, that just not, makes no sense. Somebody's mentioned in the chat is the research on MOOCs suggests that the ideal video length is six to 12 minutes. The research is, is slightly limited in what it actually tells. It, it tells you when people are most likely to drop off. And it's interesting that, that not everybody drops off at six minutes. And after about 12 minutes, there's, it doesn't particularly matter whether it's a video, it's an hour or two hours long because video, people just don't tend to drop off that much. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the video needs to be only that, uh, that long. We're kind of confusing, I think, the cause and effect there, but that's certainly, that's certainly one, one source of evidence. But let's have a look at, so this is the uh, um, YouTube channel of a business school. And so if uh, these are the top uh, 15 uh, most popular videos there, and if we look out of them, out of those, four are well over 12 minutes, and three out of those four are about an hour long, or a little over an hour. So, so that, seems, that seems odd, right? I mean, so that doesn't seem to quite go as well with, the, uh, with that sort of, Injunction, and so here's uh, I was I was interested, so I went on YouTube and I just googled calculus, and these are the the five videos that YouTube thinks I would be interested in, and as you can see, they're all longer than 12 minutes, and uh, many of them are part of a series, the, you know, the shorter ones, uh, but the, one of the uh, one of them is an hour and a half long of a of a guy standing in front of a whiteboard, and that has had 1.2 million views, and so so I, again, so we see that people are not necessarily searching by the length. Uh, 
the length of the video and, and often uh, often people are making so sort of different decisions and one reason one thing that uh, one thing that I think you can find on YouTube these days is a lot more videos are getting longer because people are more used to it but also YouTube has introduced this new feature that is very common in instructional videos or various narrative videos with inf information based videos and that's a that's, that's that's a table of contents and the table of contents essentially here is in the description. Uh, people with little time codes, and then you can you, you can jump around in the video. As you can see in here, this is a video that's an hour and a half almost long, and I've watched it multiple times because it happens to be explaining. It's like a personal manual of uh, how to use a camera that I bought, and I really wanted to learn from it. But I didn't watch an hour and a half twice. I just jumped around. I just jumped to the the bits that I needed to. To, to watch again, and and there are it actually happens to be this camera has two videos that are that are over an hour long doing exactly that same thing, and again using that table of contents, and and we we all probably using the university with platforms like like Echo 365 or or Panopto, and again you can create that table of contents, and I think that's more important. Giving to use that control of over that video is is more important, and actually having multiple two minute videos is probably just adding an extra cognitive or sort of not cognitive but extra load of just having to jump between videos. And if you look on LinkedIn Learning, uh, you know, you'll, you'll find that they will not have a, a, an hour and a half long videos, but often their, their lectures will be sort of like a, a lecture chunked into these. They're using playlists as a way of, as a table of contents. And so, so essentially, essentially looking at an hour and a half long lecture on something that is chunked into smaller, smaller chunks. And so we often sort of talk about attention as, as being important, but attention actually is a very complex problematic concept. And so we really need to think in terms of ability to construct knowledge and, uh, and how people actually take, go through that whole process of learning rather than just the cognitive load at the moment of watching. So I, I think we need to sort of be quite careful, careful there. That's not to mean that people should be recording an hour and a half long lectures, uh, but uh, I, I think that sort of 15 to 20 minutes meaningful chunks is probably quite sensible. And if, if sometimes it, it's a shorter bit, uh, you know, five to ten minutes, that's fine. If it's if it's a bit longer, that's also fine. But in a way, is how can students access it? How can they navigate it? How can they control what they're doing? I think that is really the important, uh, the important thing uh, to go. And it, again, I think I think some of the commercial providers are giving a good, uh, you know, a good account of of what that what that can be. So so the length of the video is. Um, is um, so, so. So what Scott is saying is that going back to the comments, is this small chunk perhaps to do with uh, conservation span expedition? And actually, as I as I say, really, I, I don't think the, the the attention span is that helpful in in this in this sense of concentration because. Uh, actually, what predicts success of learning is whether the users have paused the video, whether they're interacting with it. So it's not we shouldn't be thinking about in terms of in terms of the length of the video, but it's more more in terms of that sort of their control, the metacognition that is involved in watching. So so I, I think it's barking up the wrong tree, focusing on the length of the of the video, and and then we need to sort of put the research into context. So what I mean by pre-roll is these little sort of little branding things like you know this video brought to you by 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 so by by such and such, and it's just so so I just find it incredibly annoying. But also there's uh, there's some evidence that that on YouTube at least most videos actually don't get dropped off at like the six minute or twenty minute or twelve minute mark. They get dropped off in the, the five second mark because often people come to the video and just want to know what it's about. And if it starts with like a uh, like a five second introduction of, of like this is the university that brings this, this video to you, it's probably not not helping things. So you definitely want to uh, get straight to the point. And you'll find that most YouTube videos that are sort of that do this for a living, they will always start that. And and it, it's a good way of getting your it's a good way of getting your uh, you know branding being hated by users if they have to watch a bunch of five minute videos and they each of them have a five second a little intro that that just that, that that's just kind of um, that's a little pre-roll. So, so I, I don't think there's any there's any benefit to that. And then essentially, it's taking away the control, the nav navigation control from the user. It's kind of like those FBI warnings on DVDs that you can skip. So that it's kind of you're doing that to them, because it's um, uh, it's it's uh, it's really uh, it, it's 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 really kind of a, uh, getting in the way. So related uh, related titles is. How often should you change uh, what's on the screen, right? So we talked it's again related to that sort of cognitive cognitive load. How uh, what what should be going on? And again, the the tasks to think about here is attention and distraction and cognition. So what are what's happening? What's happening there? So I think here the answer is the, the speed of transitions should 
be relatively slow, but it shouldn't be too slow. And the question essentially, the balance you're trying to strike is that is those principles as you don't want to have too many transitions to uh, distract people, but you also don't want to stay too long on one slide. And I, somebody earlier asked the question of, are we assuming videos are slide based? And and even if you don't have, even if you don't use sort of a PowerPoint as, as a background and stuff like that, you, you, you still kind of think, you can think in terms of these, you know, what's called storyboards of sort of like a little chunks of something something on the screen. And so, so you don't want to have one that's there too long and you don't also want to perhaps transition too quickly, even though uh, on, on YouTube, uh, that is very much uh, the norm these days, these really quick sort of uh, jump cuts. And, and the principles for mayor, I think, are quite important. The signaling principle, so people are in best when they are shown exactly what to pay attention to on the screen. And the temporal contiguity principle is about speak about what's on the screen at the time. So you don't want to have too many things. But again, there are many very successful instructional videos that break this rule um, uh, appallingly. But nevertheless, they're very popular and people still can learn from them. So we can always need to keep, keep that in mind. Uh, the other question people ask is about should you uh, uh, should you uh, change angles and perspectives um, during uh, during the video? So that so sometimes that's called B-roll. Uh, that's in in the, in the movie business, right? So that's that's the when you when you have you know, talk about something, just you switch the perspective in documentaries and infotaining. It's, it's very very popular. So here's an example of of B-roll uh, in uh, in, a, in a YouTube video by uh, uh, educational YouTube video. And Thomas, this is Thomas Frank from the Info Geek um, channel, College Info Geek, and he's often makes videos about productivity. And so here he's just talking about something, what's, what's happening, and then he switches to just like generic, um, uh, generic people sort of being in a meeting doing certain things. And uh, so is is this? It's going to make it seem a bit more sort of a productiony, uh, a bit more official. And he he claims in in a podcast he talks about that actually that increases. Uh, the, the, the views that higher production, but actually, in terms of in terms of learning, there is no clear benefit in terms of um, in, in 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 sort of an in instructional video. So often people kind of want to they're kind of seduced by that approach, and they feel that, that there's a, there's an advantage. There. But I, I say there is no evidence for that. There's a, there's some very small studies that show small benefits for nursing students if uh, if you switch the perspective, but it's not that bureau kind of thing we saw from from Thomas Frank, but it's more like focusing over the shoulder versus um, versus uh, versus sort of a close up view and then uh, switching to a person. So these are there was a very small learning benefit to this, but I, again remember this is a very, this is a procedural video, whereas the example we showed sh we saw earlier is a conceptual video, and that that's quite a big difference I think as as well where we uh, where we can sort of consider those benefits and. Uh, so there's another piece of evidence is that uh, is that uh, of video biographies on on medical uh, websites and they uh, significantly improved uh, improved engagement with that provider of that medical service over having just a text video so just the video was enough but having zero actually did not uh, did not make any any difference in terms of engagement of the people so I think that's kind of a, another another good example so. And I also want to, uh, with that, I think it's probably worth addressing the question of should we uh, think in terms of the difference between whether this is a, a video made by you for your students or general purpose video for the uh, for the general audience. And I, and I think that's that's something that perhaps is important to keep in mind. But I'll I'll come to that in a, in a minute. So next question, somebody asked that earlier. Should you include your face in your video? So how is that? Uh, should there be uh, you know should should you be part of that video? And so the tasks that I want you to think about for the video to achieve is to, again, direct your attention and make a connection. So those are the two different tasks. And they, sometimes they're competing, sometimes they're, uh, they're reinforcing. And the, and the outcome of the, of the research from what we know is that the face, having a face, meaning like the video of the presenter, promotes engagement. But there is a significant uh, minority, but it's about 25% of people who actually find it distracting when they're working on uh, on whether they like that video or not. But the, but uh, but the, the others who do like it, they really report that increased engagement. So so on balance, having a face, I think, is a good good idea because you want to make that personal connection. But uh, it turns out, uh, again, some of these studies are quite underpowered, relatively small, so it's hard to make hard and fast conclusions. But it turns out uh, that there is really no, no benefit for learning one way or another. <laughs> so it doesn't seem, doesn't seem that people 
uh, despite the fact that there's a bit bit of additional cognitive load of having that person in there because people do spend some time uh, you know looking at that person and between the uh, switching between them and the content but it doesn't it doesn't seem that it has any impact on learning one way or the other uh, there is one bit of research that showed there was some advantage of having that face on direct face that so that uh, in what you see here in the in the top left hand corner is a slightly better approach than having a side on view and um, uh, for for certain kinds of videos um, as well. So that's that's something in, that's important to to keep in mind. And and the one more thing is there is a principle from Mayer's research that the static image does not help that much. So so there is no benefit really from having a if you if you're not going to have a video of you speaking, putting up a picture of you does not help. Um, or at least not consistently when you can put it up at the beginning to show people what you look like. So that's kind of where we where we are. And of course, um, uh, many, many platforms kind of let people uh, hide the, the face as well. Hmm. Yes, and, and Steve is saying, talking about so having the face as an intro, saying hello, it's me, and then going away, that's fine. But also it's important to remember there are many, many successful educational channels, Khan Academy, of course, being a, a standout here, is that where you never see the face of the person explaining, and you can still make a personal connection with that voice, uh, with sort of having quite an informal, personal, and directed, uh, directed, uh, uh, directed talk at the person. So, so the face, uh, as I say, it's probably there, there's no good reason not to have the face, but on the other hand, uh, it's it's not necessarily a huge requirement. Um, so, should the video tell a uh, should the video tell a story? That's another. A uh, frequent injunction that I, that I hear people make, and and here again, all of the all of the tasks are relevant here. But I think the most important one is the situation. So if you look at Jack Kumi's uh, guide on designing video and multimedia for for learning, he he talks very much in terms of narrative, having hooks and visual metaphors. But actually, the stories can be just as uh, 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 problematic. So there's very benefit. There are many benefits of having like a story because you can guide the viewer's attention to provide some context uh, for what they're learning about, and it can make a, help also help making a personal connection. But at the same time, it limits the viewer's control. It can sort of distract people, confuse them because not everybody understands the story the same way, and it can sort of alienate some people because they may have different different connections, uh, different different connections. So that's so I think I think that the recommendation here is that. It goes back also to, to, to the recommendations previously. It's important to have clear structure, tie together the videos with other materials, respond to the viewer needs, and sometimes having a narrative is the right solution or not. But I do often hear that question of like, oh, that, that sort of suggestion that you should always have a story in your video. And I, I don't think that there's there's any sort of evidence for that. And um, we need to sort of think about this in, in more um, in, in, in sort of a kind of more situational context. Okay, so let's talk about delivery. I'm just keep quickly glancing at the chat. Uh, uh, yes, and, and in terms of the face, Tom's talking about it's best uh, giving the learner an option to see the instructor face or not, such as Pinocchio Echo 365. But obviously, that's not always an option in some platforms, uh, in most platforms, actually. So here's some questions about delivery. So the first one I want to address whether you should write a script or not. That's a sort of hot topic and a speed of delivery. And, and for both of those questions, the task to keep in mind is, is again, making a connection. So one of the great benefits of, of, of the video is that you can make it personal. And then so, so think about, am I actually making the most out of the video by making a connection with my viewers? And, and Mayer's principles of personalization, so personal delivery is better than, infor, than sort of more formal general delivery and voice, naturally human voice is better. Uh, uh, so that's, those are the principles. So let's ask the question, should you use a script? And many people say, yes, of course, you should always use a script. Uh, but I think there's some balancing issues there. So, so when you use a script, you, you, you do have a consistent video. So if you need to uh, make a very short video, it's necessary to have something like a script. You also get free captions if you're reading the scripts, free and accurate captions. But it's really hard to make a good script, and it's even harder to read it well. So I would say, unless you really want to spend a lot of time on making this, the, the script sound natural and then and reading it, that it sort of doesn't sound like you're reading from a, from a book, um, uh, then I would say perhaps consider the advantage of not having a script because you get a much more natural uh, delivery. You take advantage of that potential of the video for making a connection. And in my experience, and I've spent a lot of time watching people record, video, record videos, is that for most educators, it is easy to speak fluently on a topic uh, that they know about 
for 10 to 15 minutes without almost any any big interruptions or disruptions. And having those small little um, disfluencies in a video can actually be beneficial because again, it makes it seem more natural. And I think Khan Academy is a very good example, which are simply somebody writing and speaking, you know, often sort of slightly backtracking and, and talking about what's happening while they're doing it. And, and they can make quite, uh, quite a powerful connection there. Um, now, in terms of, um, um, in terms of uh, the question, uh, one more uh, point in, in the chat is the screen makes it easy to edit together different takes. And that, that is true, but, but I'll, I'll speak about that, why perhaps that may not be a good idea later. So speaking fast or slow, and it turns out that actually uh, you should not speak very slow or sort of deliberately and, and slowly. Uh, and there's, there's uh, some research that suggests slightly faster speed of delivery, about 150 to 170 words per minute, which is about 10 to 20 percent faster uh, than, than normal speech can be beneficial. There's two bits of research that I found. One is very informal looking at TED Talk uh, averages of the most popular TED Talks, and they're, they're roughly uh, slightly, uh, they're, they're slightly um, uh, faster. And there's another bit of research on MOOCs that showed videos with more words per minute uh, have bit bigger engagement. Uh, so th that's just, just like a small point about that. And again, it goes all back to the speaking naturally. naturally. Next, questions about format. So I want to address these questions. So visuals and slide formatting, uh, use of animations, and the quality over quantity and production value. So what should your slides what should your slides look like? And what I'm, and I'm sort of just, I'm sort of admitting here is that most of our videos as educators will have slides in them. So that's like, it's a start, it's a starting point. And obviously not all videos have slides. You may just speak directly, but remember that multimedia principle having text and audio or images and visuals and audio is, is an important thing. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes not, um, sometimes sort of having, going through that additional production overhead may not be that beneficial. So I, I'm sort of coming from the, the idea you start with a slide, even if, uh, even if you, you don't actually use slides. And again, the, the, the key things to keep in mind is attention, conceptualization, distraction, and cognition. So those are, that's kind of what, what you need to think about when you design those visuals. And here are some of the mayor's principles, but I'm not going to list them. And essentially, this is often the PowerPoints that people start with, like some of them that looks something like this. And I think um, that obviously is, breaks every single rule, so it's probably better not to have, have these slides because that, that they're, they're making, uh, making the cognitive load of the processing much more difficult. Uh, and, but you can, re you can redesign them in terms of that so that they look a bit more like this. So there's a lot less on the, the screen. There's a combination of graphics, um, uh, gra graphics and text. Um, there, is a, there, there are sort of essentially little, little summaries and so on. So, so this is... Uh, there is a way to kind of slightly reduce the amount of information that's on the slide or whatever the visual, whatever the visual is. And I sort of summarize this under the heading as kind of one bullet, one slide. So if you have a list of bullets that has, uh, that has loads and loads of uh, points, uh, break it up into, into multiple slides like, like this, for example. So you may start with something that's like that, what's on the left. Uh, and then I would break it down into having a title slide, then a little kind of overview of the key points that they exist with little icons, and then have each point uh, separately on, on a slide like that. And that goes for presentations in general, but if you're particularly combining it with video, I think that's very, uh, that's very important. And um, addressing the question of screen recording versus slides, and I think that I think in a way, again, we know from the practice, I'm not aware of any research that, that looks at that in detail. Uh, if anybody knows, do let me know. But uh, but there is, um, if you look at the practice out there, that we do know that screen recording is very popular. So Khan Academy is essentially screen recording, but also about all of the practical videos on on LinkedIn learning of like how to use Microsoft Word or PowerPoint or whatever, they will use they will use slides. You know, they will use screen recording. So I think that's that's quite that's quite uh, quite a sensible option. So uh, sorry, no, we already covered face. My apologies. Uh, next question, and this kind of a, this is a controversial one. Should you, should you use animations? And people often quite like animations. They look fun. They look like they're sort of how people learn. Uh, but let's think about this again from the from the task you're trying to achieve. So you're trying to direct attention, reduce distraction. Uh, 
promote conceptualization and also give people control and improve navigation. And the, the, the quite clear research-based guidance is that only animate processes that require movement. So do not, so for example, that, that means animate things like, uh, animate things like uh, little uh, um, assembling of something or, or uh, or, or where there is, for example, like a dynamic flow within physics or something like that. But if it's like a, if, it, if it's like an admissions process, it's actually having a step-by-step -step thing is much better than, than animation. So we can see some examples here of, uh, on, on the screen. We have so two different approaches uh, of, uh, again, we have Khan Academy on the right. On the left, we have three blue, one brown. And, and you can see there's very, there's kind of very different approaches uh, to, to, vid uh, to video. And so one of them has lots of things moving all the time. And, and they're both very popular, but in terms of in terms of the learning and cognitive load, there's a lot more out there on the left um, going on, and you probably can learn more from that very basic Khan Academy video than, than from these uh, animations. Even though those animations do have some advantages in terms of promoting conceptualization, so again, you're making that you're you're, this, you're sort of making some trade-offs there. Uh, uh, so oh, so 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 the key thing here to uh, to to pay attention to that is that temporal contiguity. So show what you're talking about when you're talking about it and signaling indicate what people should pay attention to. So that I think is the important thing. That addresses Rebecca's question is uh, bullet points appearing step-by-step -step releases understanding. And no, that's not what I mean. What I mean is, is animating, for example, if you're, uh, if, if you want to animate an admissions process and there is literally um, little animations of like somebody walking into a school, picking up a form and stuff like that. So I've seen things like that, but bullets appearing side by side is not really uh, an animation. So animation is quite useful also if you can draw attention to something, uh, something that people, uh, people should pay attention to. So animation on its own is not a problem, but over animating uh, is probably not useful. It can be harmful, and also it's probably not worth the, the huge expense of making animations because animation is quite expensive. So uh, finally, a question of how highly produced should your videos be, or sort of quality over quantity? And uh, I think the important thing again is think about the situation in which you are and the connection that you're trying to make with your learners. And actually, Sal Khan, the founder of uh, of, of Khan Academy, made a really interesting video. Of, um, uh, about the, his style, his approach, it, then of course, then it's been replicated in, in many ways. And he essentially makes those same points. You know, don't um, uh, be conversational, use visuals and colors, but don't be too fancy. Um, you know, just hand drawn is, is fine. And it's better to have more stuff rather than, than less. Uh, prepare your, your notes, but speak without, off the top of your mind, don't use scripts and, and sort of, and, and keep the length in sort of small meaningful chunks. So I think that's a, um, that's that's that uh, that's kind of a useful thing, and you can see the benefits on terms of, in terms of learning may may be quite limited. So, for example, here's the same video in three steps from LinkedIn Learning on negotiation, and you can see sort of going into in these sort of production um, production improvements, and we may sort of see certain benefits there, but it's not at all clear that they that in terms of learning uh, we're actually getting getting that benefit. So here's another two examples side by side. So on the left hand side we have somebody explaining. Uh, a mathematical concept, which is very basic, so whiteboard. And then on the right hand side, we have an, an introduction to economics, which is kind of in that more YouTube jump cut style that's from the Marginal Revolution University, explaining various concepts. You see, very busy, lots of stuff happening, also jump cuts back and forth, uh, relatively short videos. Uh, whereas uh, on the left hand left side, we have 40 minute videos, and they roughly have the same amount of views. And, and I think they both may have a place for learning, but can we actually say that the huge expense that went into making the video on, 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 on the right uh, was worth, in, worth it in terms of learning is, is, is I'm not, I don't think necessarily that would be the case. Um, but there is not a lot of research that shows that would compare exactly these two things. And we see, in, we often get seduced by YouTube videos. So on YouTube, lots of stuff is, we see evolution from people kind of going from, uh, from sort of more basic to more elaborate. But again, they have a very different approach to, uh, a very different approach to uh, the to, uh, to video creation. So you know we can see uh, that the change of production value is, is there, but are, are people actually learning more um, with, with this? Um, I don't. Uh, you know I, I think we can we can hardly say whether that's the case or not. And then again, so this is the marginal revolution economics, and we can sort of see that that we don't necessarily even see that much of it in terms of benefit in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the developments. In terms of views. 
And the reason I want to bring that up is because uh, one of the pieces of feedback I was getting is that why doesn't everybody make videos? It just everybody has a phone. It's so easy to make a video um, and we're just snapping, you know, just kind of pushing a button on your phone. And it actually turns out, uh, and this is this is this is not not a real research-based uh, thing. This is just a, my illustration of this thing that uh, I've experienced. Is that there's a sort of a hockey stick in terms of effort and skill and technology required as you're going from, uh, you know, making your toddler video uh, to make a holiday video and then recording a lecture and recording with a green screen or camera video. Uh, and so the more editing and the more footage you're trying to put together, the steeper the curve is. And then there, there's so much more to learn. So, so I think it's important to, uh, to keep that in mind, that particularly with you know, sort of the knowledge that the benefits for learning may not be there uh, over the investment on the sort of sort of superficial production value. And again, from the, all the experts, so expert um, uh, video producers are saying that if you are focusing on something, focus on the sound on the quality of sound. Again, I haven't seen any, any research that confirms this, but, but when you speak to uh, the video producers, they say, make sure you get your sound right and the video and pr overall production value are not nearly, uh, not, not nearly as important. Um, of, of course, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, uh, there, there's a lot more involved, but often people sort of ask me, oh, can I, uh, you know, how can I edit this video? I've made a little thing, a, a little sort of mistake. I like to do something. I like to sort of slightly edit my video. And my advice to people is that if you if you really need to correct a mistake in a 10-minute video, it's it takes longer to edit it than to record it twice. But also, as I've already mentioned, small imperfections in the video make it more like a real lecture, real connection. So you, it's probably not worth it, worth it correcting that unless you have a particular sort of um, uh, thing in mind. And again, uh, the the biggest lesson here, I think, is from in terms of production is that going from no video to having a video is more important is more important than having a highly produced video. So um, finally, I wanted to address the question of something that's often forgotten. How do you present the videos to students? And uh, because we often just think, oh, I've made a video and then send a link to it and that's done. But actually, we, the video doesn't just exist as a video, it exists in a in, in context. And so we need to think in terms of here, how, what is the context of conceptualization? How do people navigate control? What is the situation in which they're watching? it? And video is different from text, that it's, it's a fixed time commitment. So it's, it's, it's very hard to skim or scan or skip unless uh, you, you, uh, you, you enable that in some way. Difficult to navigate. It's bound to an equipment. It's sort of unimodal. You cannot listen to music and watch the video at the same time. And so when students watch the video, they often watch them strategically. They may increase the speed. Sometimes they only listen. Sometimes they only watch the video and have the captions on. Sometimes they will use a mobile device. So all of those things are important to keep in mind. Don't just think in terms of how have I produced my videos, but how have I presented it to my students? Are there the playlists? Can they bookmark it? Can they skip by the transcript? Can they change the speed of playback? Can they use keyboard shortcuts to navigate? Can they use the captions? Uh, can they search the captions in, as text? Can they download it? Can they silently uh, play it back and just watch what's on the screen? So all those things are important. And uh, the, the different platforms out there that you can look at uh, will have different affordances. They, they will allow you different things. LinkedIn Learning, you cannot present your own video on LinkedIn Learning, but I would sort of consider that to be the gold standard for how you present videos. So, so have spend some time on LinkedIn Learning or, or Coursera or similar ones. And I think they have really spent a lot of time fine tuning the watching experience, both on the mobile app and on the website. And, uh, and then you have uh, other, other tools like, like Panopto or um, some like Canvas or uh, VLE, and they all have sort of different uh, advantages and disadvantages. In the document, I've outlined sort of what I would say, uh, the, the feature sets of these different platforms and, and sort of start them in terms of, in, in terms of the benefits they give you. So uh, again, you can read more about that in, uh, in, that, in, in that document. But I really wanted to stress here is that if you, uh, it's important to let students share with each other how they watch and then recommend the, info, the features of the, of the video player. So it, it's not just, don't just kind of put it there, expect that the, every student will get the most out of it. Spend some time uh, with your students if, if that's the context in which you are in of sort of uh, sh let them share, but also share with them some ideas on how they can uh, watch the videos. And we, I've created the docu document, I'll probably, uh, it's not published yet, but I, I will share that as well with you on for guide for students on how to watch videos. 
And yes, I, I see this digital study skills as being important here. And then finally, the final word here is that the flipped class is the question of the flipped classroom. So, so it's not just a, not, I talked about the, the, the technical settings, but also how do you integrate into the instructional, instructional um, setting? And then, uh, and then so we have the traditional approach, we have attending a lecture, and then you do some homework, uh, home activities, whereas compared to that, we have the flipped. Uh, approach. We have the people watch the lecture first, and then they come to class, and then they have classroom activities. And it's the first approach, the traditional approach, is easy to prepare. It's very, but it's very teacher centered, and, but and it's also time specific, which can be both a plus or a disadvantage. The the flipped classroom is much more demanding to prepare for the teacher, but it's more student centered and much more flexible. So uh, you, you have those sort of things to keep in mind. But what does the research tell us about how effective flipped classroom is? And um, it's a mixed success. So students like the flexibility, but it requires more work. It helps better students, surprisingly, more than some of the slower students. It's unclear what impact is there on attendant, on attainment, and it's important. It's better for procedural learning. I think that's really important for procedural or conceptual. So, so those are some of the things to, to keep in mind. That, uh, but many other things we talked about already come become relevant here. Right? Make sure there's a clear structure that's relevant to class activities. Make sure the activities. Uh, that you do in class, expect that the video was watched. There's a lot of understanding of che checking of understanding before people come into your class. Uh, free training is a principle that I think is very relevant for mayors is that people learn better if they already know some of the information. So make sure that again, uh, again, people sort of, uh, focus on that. So I want to end here. I, I, uh, I um, do not want to talk about production tools uh, other than uh, a quick point is that is that PowerPoint is actually can be quite a useful production tool for video. So people often underestimate well, how many features there are. And finally, a, a hat tip to uh, to a new tool that, that's been around for about a year. It's called Descript. And, and that's uh, where you can edit a video by editing the, the transcript of the video. And, and it's really clever. And I play around with it. It's very useful. So if you need to do a lot of video editing, uh, this is a very useful tool for that. So uh, I will finish here just so with a reminder. Remember, it's better to have a video than no video. And I also want to share, share this link here to that Padlet if you can let me know of things, um, things that you feel that you've learned, things that you will uh, have uh, stopped, you already do, things that you um, will start doing, things that you'll look into, things you'll stop doing, and perhaps things you disagree about, you have questions about. And I've realized we've just run, run out of time, uh, but uh, please, I'm, I'm happy to hang around for uh, as long as people have questions. And do feel to uh, do get in touch with me if you have any comments or suggestions. So let me just have a look at the the chat. So if there were any questions that came up earlier that I missed as I was speaking, I did try to keep an eye on it. Do let me know and put them there in again. And I'm also have a let me have a quick look at what's happening on the Padlet. So screencasts, yes, already people already using screencasts. Um, yeah, story. <laughs> look into we'll look into storyboarding. Okay, yeah, no, that's that's certainly an option. So I'm just gonna sharing that here. Dominic, uh, if you're happy for me to, I can add the links into the recording that will be emailed out to everyone. Uh, yes, yes, please do do share those links. Yes, I'm gonna put the links to the uh, to this in the chat again. Link to the all the materials that I've talked about. Okay, we we'll look into pre-roll. So I'm hoping that you will look into pre-roll, not using it. <laughs> Somebody saying uh, editing versus uh, re-recording. Okay. Okay, recommending certain. Okay. Oh uh, yes, any evidence? Somebody's asking any evidence showing that increases interactivity when inserting quizzes and videos. And the answer is yes. That actually is quite. That is there. I would say. There is some evidence, but again, it's mostly about in terms of the procedural learning. And I think it's important to keep in mind. So if you have a begin, if you have a very highly technical lecture video, a STEM subject where you need to make sure people are kind of building the knowledge slowly, it makes a lot of sense to put quizzes as the video goes in uh, for that procedural learning 
and and and, and there is uh, evidence that shows that, that that is beneficial if it's or a more conceptual video, I don't think that that evidence is is, is there quite uh, quite as much. Uh, but uh, again, the research is relatively limited. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, people will ask students. Good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. By the way, one of the, the one of the tools that I didn't mention is H5P. You can, if you do need, if you, if if you have some videos and you need to embed interactivity in the video, H5P does a really good job. If your university is Nocto, there's a way to in, enter a quiz and and embed things in videos as well. So definitely recommend uh, recommend that. Somebody mentioned Stream on the Padlet. Uh, that's quite good as as well. Uh, but uh, I don't have that much experience with uh, with that. So Mata was saying high, higher order activities for conceptual learning. Yeah, it, it really kind of, I think, I think conceptual learning, this is kind of an underappreciated and underinvestigated uh, aspect of, 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 this, of this idea of sort of, of, of a video. So I, uh, I'm not aware of that much research that, that sort of, that looks in that, uh, at that in detail, but, but I quite do, do quite like sort of Diana Lorillard's approach in, the, in rethinking university teaching where she talks a lot about a lot about that, uh, the importance of that. So she focuses much more on, on the conceptual side of learning rather than the procedural thing. Okay. If nobody's got any further questions, I'm gonna stop the recording now if that's okay. Okay, very good, thank you. <laughs>